continue on with this discussion of oxygen, hemoglobin, saturation. And what I tried to impress upon you before the break is that um, looking at this list of terms, obviously, the one I put in number one in big letters, the partial pressure of O2, that's the number one influence of uh, the saturation, it gives us that sigmoid shaped curve. Sigmoid means S shaped. But there are other things that can influence the hemoglobin saturation. Other factors. Think about blood pH. You get that lactic acid burn. It makes blood a little more acidic. So more acidic means decrease, right? CO2, um, increased metabolism, that's going to increase the CO2 level. There's another molecule your book doesn't really mention, but I'll mention it. It's a molecule called BPG. <clears throat> In exercise, that level of that molecule increases. All of these factors increase oxygen unloading. So it's going to decrease the saturation. our brains on the sigmoid shaped curve in the condition of rest, not exercise. Here they show two people, sea level up in the mountains. And um, what this figure reminds us, what we talked about before the break, because I erased it, plateau, the flat part of the curve, good for internal respiration. Because at the lungs, no matter if you're at sea level or at altitude, even though the air is getting a little bit thinner, um, you're pretty much well saturated. Okay, so remember, the plateau is good for the external respiration, but that steep slope for your body's tissues, where you're, where you're um, whether you're just reclining at the park or vigorous exercise, <clears throat> it's good for dropping it off. In the condition of rest, they say 75 percent. Okay, when the PO2 is about 40, but vigorous exercise. You drop off way more. Okay, that's why that steep slope is good. With um, these changes, you become less saturated. So what I say here is phrases it better. More O2 diffuses into the blood down the larger partial pressure gradient because of that steep slope. Um, <clears throat> right. Now I'll slide on BPG because I didn't. I don't think it's mentioned in the book. Right there. But that is an acronym for. 2,3-bi-phosphoglycerate, just call it BPG. Let's remember, remember what um, our red blood cells are. Let's remember how when they're formed in the bone marrow, do you remember how they spit out all the organelles? Do you remember how they shrink in size? And they even spit out the nucleus. Okay. They're literally just bags of hemoglobin. So, but they still have metabolism, but it's going to have to be non-oxidative, <coughs> not dependent upon oxygen. And that's good because you don't want them to use the oxygen for their own cell metabolism. They're supposed to transport the O2, not burn it. Other cells do that. So they have to have non-oxidative metabolism. Well, anyways, one of these non-oxidative enzymes is this, is this BPG. Turns out BPG 
and binds hemoglobin at a site that negatively affects the binding of O2 to hemoglobin. So when you exercise, if you increase that enzyme, which you would, it's kind of kind of like bump off the O2. So that's why it helps to increase the oxygen unloading during exercise. BPG levels are elevated during exercise. Now, so why did I mention that whole exercise and these factors? It's because we see a shift in the oxygen hemoglobin saturation curve. They shift the curve down and to the right, these things. You can shift the curve one way or the other. Which one is down to the right, A or B? B. Down and to the right. Okay. So what that means is that at any given at any given PO2, you're less saturated. HB is less saturated. What I had said pr prior is you're increasing the unloading. You're less saturated. Different way of saying the same thing. Any questions on that phraseology? Increase O2 unloading. HB is less saturated. Let it process. Um, let's think of it this way. <clears throat> Pretend the black curve is, is the normal condition or P50. Um, the ballpark 50%. Right around here. Boom. 50. Our normal curve provides 50% saturation. What's P50? What's the number here? Right there, 27. Under normal conditions. Okay. Let, let's pretend that's like you sit in a regular chair. That's flat. You can sit in the chair and you can get up and get out of the chair. Okay. You can load the chair by sitting in it. And you unload it by getting out of the chair, standing up. All right. So let, let's pretend that's 27. But now we shift it. A little bit to the right. I won't even put a number to it, but what changed with P50? Did it increase or decrease? It increased. So, what happened here is P, P50 increased. means it takes more oxygen to saturate at 50% in these conditions during the condition of exercise. It takes more O2 to saturate at 50% Let's think of in terms of our, our chair analogy. It's easier to unload. So it's like if the chair were like slanted. You can still sit in that chair, but it's easier to slide off. Okay, you increase the ability to unload during exercise. And isn't this beneficial for exercise? Don't you want to drop it off more in the tissues? Um, yeah, y y you do. Okay, I mean, um, yeah, that, that's how I think of it. Okay, it takes more oxygen to saturate at 50%. At any given saturation, it's like 
you, you're less saturated. The whole thing is shifted. Um, let's see, what's another way I can put it? Okay, think of it this way. Um, okay, let's go to our 27. Before, under normal conditions, we were 50% saturated. Well, let's say we're exercising now. What's my saturation? It's, it's, I'm less saturated, correct? You guys see that relationship? This is beneficial for exercise. All right, so any, any questions on the whole shifting thing, right? You're, you're processing, think about it. Are you able to put together any questions now? Now, we can shift one way or the other, right? You can shift the other way. So let me just throw that on the board. Be, uh, for no, not necessarily ideal, but it is, it is what happens during exercise, which is ideal because that's what your body is trying to accomplish. Yeah. And of course, you know the long-term benefits of exercise are super. So yeah, it is ideal. Yes, because I all want you to exercise. Uh, yeah. Uh. I don't think the uh, PO2 would change too much if you're below sea level. So no, I don't think it does, off the top of my head. Why do you think it does? Monitoring these different things that I wrote on the board here. So does it make sense to you that if normal body temperature is 38, that when it gets warmer, again, you get that right word shift, but when it gets colder, it shifts the other way. Um, and, and it's the same thing for CO2 or BPG. It shifts one way if it increases, and it shifts the other way. And so shifting the other way is, is, is just the opposite. It, it, um, at any given partial pressure, hemoglobin's um, more saturated, okay? And usually, um, <clears throat> what we say is the conditions maybe in the lung are a little bit like thinking it shifts a little bit to the left because in the lungs, if you breathe cold air, it brings the temperature down a little bit and all those things kind of reverse at the lung. But um, don't, don't write that down, don't write that down. I'm just trying to get you to think it can shift one way or the other. Usually the one I harp on is the one with the condition of exercise. This physical activity is um, usually the biggest determinant in shifting the curve one way or the other. And we call that shift the Bohr effect. Shifting the oxygen hemoglobin saturation curve down to the right during exercise. It facilitates the unloading of oxygen or hemoglobin of blood passing through active muscle beds. This unloading of oxygen makes it available to tissues to support <clears throat> increased metabolic demand. So that's the one I like to focus on. Shift down to the right, the Bohr effect. Okay, so now let's start to talk about CO2. So we were talking about oxygen. For oxygen, the blood picks it up at the lungs, and then you use the arteries to deliver the oxygen-rich blood to the tissues. But CO2 is like a metabolic waste product. It's in the tissues. The blood vessels that collect the blood from the tissues are your veins. So we gotta think about how do we get this out of the tissues, into the veins, back to the lungs. And because this is how we transport CO2. And, well, okay, well, I already talked about it. 
Remember when we took these notes down? 7%, 23%, 70%. This is how we can get blood to transport the CO2. And I gave you the numbers, right? It's 100% was 60, then it broke down like 5, 15, and um, 40, okay, but those numbers. So we already covered that ground, but okay, just think about the concept of getting rid of CO2, extracting it from the tissue. So the act of ventilation, partial pressure of metabolic waste CO2 is kept low in the alveoli. This creates a gradient to move CO2 from the tissue to the blood to the alveoli so you can breathe it off, right? So it's accumulating air in the tissues. It's 45. And then in your lungs, you constantly breathe off um, air so you can kind of keep the alveolar air at 40. Think of that as the gradient for gas to diffuse out of the tissues into the blood and into the lungs so you can just breathe it off to the atmosphere. All right. So that's kind of what we're talking about for CO2. And it, it is a metabolic waste product, and you have to consider this chemistry equation because we mostly transport it in the form of bicarbonate. Before I erase my thing here, to finish off my chair analogy, if shifting it down to the right, the chair, the chair is it's easier to slide off the chair. The blue curve is, it's, it's harder to get out of the chair. So it's like if the chair was like, like that. Okay, like if you, you can get in there, it's harder to get out, you can, but that, that's what that shift means. It, it's, um, at any given oxygen tension, it, it's easier to saturate the hemoglobin. All right, so anyways, okay, back to this. Here's the equation you gotta know for CO2 transport. CO2 is hydrated with water. It's a reversible equation, but if you're going this way to the right, it comes carbonic acid. <clears throat> and carbonic acid is a weak acid that partially dissociates into bicarb and a hydrogen proton. So that's why CO2 can affect pH, because carbonic acid can acidify the blood. All right, so that's why that equation is important for this mixture. And the enzyme that helps speed this up is carbonic and hydrates. I just abbreviated CA. So in my uh, equation here, I'm gonna put that right over here. It helps this go faster. CO2 and H2O, they're relatively inert molecules, which means they won't interact very fast. Uh, so, but this enzyme makes it happen much faster. So that's why we say this enzyme, quote unquote, wets the CO2, it combines it with water. Well, it's not present in the plasma, but it is associated with the RBCs. On RBC surface. That has a little side note for you. So let's pretend um, your muscles, the CO2 is accumulating. So the pink represents muscle cells, and you're trying to push that CO2 into the blood. Again, three ways you do it you just dissolve it in the plasma. You bind it to hemoglobin, that's the, the carbaminal hemoglobin we noted earlier, it's about 23-25%. Mostly, it's transported in the form of 70% bicarbonate. So, I guess it could happen in the plasma but very slowly without carbonic anhydrase. But on the surface of the RBC with carbonic anhydrase, it happens much faster. Okay, That's how we transport it here. So let's start to think about how Bohr and Haldane are affected here. I don't even think I've mentioned the Haldane effect yet. Let's, let's redefine Bohr. Let's think of the four things. Ooh, let's see if I can remember. Oh, body temp. Exercise, did that go up or down? Uh, <clears throat> let's see, what's the other one? pH of the blood. It went down, it got more acidic. 
more, more um, hydrogen ions, so pH drop, and uh, the partial pressure of CO2, up or down. That one up with exercise, and BPG, that one up. So all these things, it shifted our curve down to the right. Shift, curve, oh, that's the um, O2 hemoglobin sap curve, in case you look at your notes later and you can't remember which curve we're talking about. <clears throat> anyway, shift that curve down to the right. Uh, basically, we say a rightward shift. And anyways, we call this the Bohr effect. It's a person. So that's what, I, what, that's what I write here, pretend you're exercising. Um, and what they're trying to show you here is the internal respiration. So what they got here is a blood cell. And they got cells that need the oxygen. And um, the main way you transport the O2 is you, you drop off, you drop it off from the hemoglobin. Okay, that's the main way. However, it is also transported, just dissolved in the plasma, and that's a small way you can deliver the O2. So what I'm saying is, if you're exercising and these conditions um, are in effect, you shift the whole curve to the right, you call that Bohr effect. So it's kind of like, um, think of CO2 as trying to get on the bus, but the Bohr effect is people getting off the bus. Okay, like for example, you know, I, I used to take the bus, you know, like when I was in grad school, I used to stand on Santa Monica Boulevard, and I used to watch the big blue bus come, and I could tell when the bus was full, I was like, oh crap, I'm gonna be late for class. Because I can't get on the bus, because it's completely full. So when they stop, people get off the bus. That's the only way I can get on the bus, right? If no one gets off the bus, I can't get on. That's kind of like the situation for CO2. Um, for CO2, next to a, a cell, CO2 is waiting at the bus stop. I'm going to symbolize CO2 with blue dots. My oxygen is red dots. Okay, here comes the bus, the hemoglobin. Blood is mostly saturated, like almost 100%. Let's just say the bus is full. Okay. And it's like <clears throat> you drop off some O2, let's say one gets off the bus, then what can get on the bus? CO2. Turns out CO2, it actually can bind hemoglobin. I think that's shown here. That's our carbamino hemoglobin. You know, hemoglobin can bind four O2s. So how many CO2s can it bind? Four. Well, in this case, it's only going to bind one because only one gets off the bus. So I'm going to draw a little blue dot getting on. What percentage is that? 25%. That's why this number, carbamino, is like 23. It's close to 25. That's why it's only that. Because normally, that's what happens. Okay. Now, if it's, if it's the Bohr effect, you're dropping off more O2 and more CO2 can get on the bus. That's the Haldane effect. Um, so number one, Bohr, then number two, Haldane. That's kind of how I think of it. Haldane happens because of the Bohr effect, basically. Yeah, let me see how I want to phrase that. OK, let's kind of hammer that on. I'm going to erase this. So 
CO2 will get on. Okay. Yeah. That's not the only thing to do. That is my understanding. Did the bus analogy help? Yes. Big time. I'll have to keep using that one. Let's see. Okay, so let's talk about. Um, mm, okay, so. More effect. Increased unloading. Increased O2. Okay, that's number one on that slide. And, well, what I want you to know is this unloading allows uh, two things. Number one, more CO2 loading to HB. Number two, you shift that equation to the right. I'll rewrite the equation. So the equation I'll rewrite it, I erased it. It's the CO2 plus H2O reversible. You shift it this way because you're trying to get it in the form of bicarbonate because that's one of the main ways how we transport it and get it into the plasma. Now, um, that's on the slide too. Which is the fast <coughs> way, on or off the RBC? The fast way was on the RBC because of that enzyme. But however, it's like you're stuck on the surface. So you kind of kind of have to get off. There's this thing called the chloride shift where you trade um, the bicarb for the chloride ion just to keep the negative. You're trading a negative for a negative, basically. But what that does is you, you get the bicarb <coughs> in the plasma compartment. You get it off the RBC. I'll, I'll move that. Let's see. Uh, so, put your carbonic and hydrase. This is on the RBC surface. Now, once you do this uh, chemistry, chloride shift. <clears throat> I want to write it. It transfers bicarbonate to the plasma compartment. Lesba, the yellow liquid part of your blood. So that's the bore whole day. Um, this is at the tissues, the internal respiration. So you just kind of reverse everything at external respiration. So the PO2 is high enough to where um, now you pick it up right here. And then you drop off the CO2. The, um, the CO2 is released from the carbamino hemoglobin, and also you reverse this equation the other way. Now it's chloride shift in reverse. And so on, on the surface, what you want to do is get the bicarbonate in the CO2 form so that it can diffuse into the alveolar space. Okay. Form your oxyhemoglobin, and I'm going to put release hemoglobin 
oh, I'm sorry, release CO2 from HbCO2. That's our carbamino hemoglobin. And also shift our equation there to the left. You want to reform CO2 in the CO2 form because it's been transported as bicarbonate. Okay. So I'll just put reform CO2. That way you can exchange with the alveolar air. Is that enzyme still playing into effect? Yeah, yeah. Still operating on the surface. That is correct. Well, here's a slide just teaching you the concept. Um, don't study in detail. Just look at the two blue lines. The light blue line is if hemoglobin saturation is zero. And it just shifts up because what it's trying to tell you is at any partial pressure of CO2, you're just getting more into the blood. That's all this is showing you. When it's saturated, you get less CO2 in the blood. When hemoglobin is less saturated, well, you get more CO2 in the blood. That's the whole bus analogy thing. If more get off the bus, more can get on. That's all that's really teaching us. So just to recap, Bohr and Haldane, um, yeah, I think I went over it enough in context of lecture. Once again, for think about the Bohr effect in the peripheral tissues. What would, you, what would you put? More or less acidic in the blood of the tissues. We, we said it was more acidic, so the pH drops. And what did we say for CO2? We said it's higher. What about this one? Higher. And what about temperature? Higher. So I'm trying to get you to think about more effect. So once you got those parameters memorized, how did we say it shifted? We said it shifted to the right. And A and D, how would you put this? Does A and D, what we said, does it facilitate more oxygen loading or oxygen unloading? Which one is correct? It's more unloading. This is the blank effect, bore effect. So if these choices, Unloading and bore is what I was trying to get you to think. And it's this graph here. Okay, so that's kind of the train of thought. And the last thing I mentioned about Haldane is as a result of oxygen unloading, we get CO2 loading. Okay? And what effect was that when you get more CO2 loading? Haldane. Okay. As a result of the O2 unloading, we get CO2 loading. That was halting. So is that at the lung? This is at the tissue. Because remember, that is where you're trying to get CO2 out of, out of the tissues. It's a waste product building in the tissues. You want to get it back to the lung. So to get into the blood, you have to unload the CO2 at the tissues to then pick up CO2 at the tissues. Um, what direction? Are you talking about this? Mm, no, um, let me go back to the slide. Sorry. No, no, that's okay. Here's the board holding slide. Okay. So I'll, that statement was referring to this. So I put number one and number two for a reason. I think of it this way. Hemoglobin is completely saturated. So when it gets to the tissues, it drops off the O2. That happens first. People get off the bus. And as a result of that, um, more people can get on the bus. That's all day. So number one happens, and as a result, number two happens. That's what I put over here. As a result of more O2 unloading, it allows more CO2 loading, and let, let's put Haldane next to that notation. So number one and number two, 
in your notes, add this to it. Call that the holding effect. Okay. <clears throat> Your favorite people for this lecture, bored all day. Yes. Yes. I put this slide um, to make sure I taught everything. What I realized I didn't teach, I didn't teach you how to calculate this. Um, so I'm thinking, don't worry about it. I'll make sure that question is not on your exam. Now, I made the exam to be available after class, but uh, what's it do? Tuesday. Tuesday. I did set it for that. And so you're all set. And there's no written part. It's just you, you can use your notes just like the other proctorial exams. Um, it's all set, good to go. Are there any questions about the logistics of lecture exam six on proctorial? Okay. Um, I didn't schedule a lab because I know you have an online test and if you want to stay and study and mull the stuff over and ask me questions now, that's great. I'll be in my office this afternoon if you have, if you're able to come up with questions by then or you can email me. So if you don't need to just stay and study, you're dismissed. Also, I have your blood typing test. If you would like to see that, uh, stick around. I can let you uh, review that in class. Thanks.